Section 12 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Adelicia of Louvain, Chapter 1, Part 2. Adelicia frequently attended her royal husband on his progresses. Her presence was, doubtless, of medicinal influence in those fearful hours when the pangs of troubled conscience brought the visitations of an evil spirit upon Henry, and either sleep forsook his pillow, or brought visionary horrors in its train. In the year 1130, the king complained to Grimbald, his Saxon physician, that he was sore disquieted of nights, and that he seemed to see a great number of husbandmen with their rustic tools stand about him, threatening him for wrongs done against them. Sometimes he appeared to see knights and soldiers threatening him, which sight so feared him in his sleep, that oft times he rose undressed out of his bed, took weapon in hand, and sought to kill them he could not find. Grimbald, his physician, being a notably wise man, expounded his dreams by true conjecture, and willed him to reform himself by alms and prayer, as Nebuchadnezzar did by the counsel of Daniel. It is probable that the unfortunate troubadour knight, Luke de Bar, was not forgotten by the conscience-stricken monarch, though historians have not recorded that his mangled form was among the ghastly dramatis persona that, in his later years, made King Henry's knights horrible. No enviable state of companionship, we should imagine, for the young and the innocent, being whose fate was indissolubly linked with his. It must have been a relief at all times to Adelicia, when her royal husband's presence was required in Normandy. On the death of Adelicia's uncle, Pope Callistus II, a dispute occurring in the election of two rival pontiffs as successor to the papal chair, Henry proceeded to the continent, in the year 1130, in the hope of reaping some political advantage from the candidate whose cause he espoused. His arrangements were perfectly satisfactory as to that matter, but he was, to the last degree, harassed by the quarrels between his daughter and her unbeloved spouse, Geoffrey of Anjou. After he had thrice adjusted their differences, Matilda, on some fresh offense which she either gave or took, abjured her husband's company, departed from his court, and claimed the protection of the king her father, with whom she once more returned to England, having, by the eloquence of tears and complaints, succeeded in exciting his indignation against her husband, and persuading him that she was an injured person. Soon after their arrival in England, a parliament was summoned to meet at Northampton, September 1131, where the oath of fealty to Matilda, as the heiress of England, was once again renewed by the general estates of the nation. It was a subject of the greatest disappointment, both to the sovereign and to the people, that there was no prospect of either Queen Adelicia or the Empress Matilda, though both were still young and beautiful women, bringing heirs to the crown. So desirable was the possibility of the royal line being continued through Matilda considered, that when the Count of Anjou sent a humble entreaty to his haughty consort to return to him, the King and Parliament seconded his request, and all due submissions having been made by Geoffrey, Matilda was at length induced to return to him. A passage from Mazarin cast some light on the mysterious separation that took place between the widowed empress and her new spouse. After the nuptials of this pair, a monk came to Matilda, and declared that her late lord, the Emperor Henry, had not died at Utrecht, as she and all the world supposed, but that he finished his days as a servant in a hospital, which severe penance he had sworn to inflict on himself for his heavy sins. When dying at Angers, the disguised emperor discovered himself to this monk, his confessor, who came to Matilda with the news. In conclusion, it is said, the empress attended the deathbed of Henry V, and recognized and acknowledged him as the emperor her first husband this is a fine tragic tale whether it be true or false the following year was remarkable for a destructive fire which consumed the greatest part of london 
but soon after this national calamity the joyful news that the empress matilda had given birth to a prince diverted the attention of the royal family from the contemplation of this misfortune and cast the last gleam of brightness on the declining years of the king the young prince was named henry after his royal grandfather the king of england the normans called him fitz empress but king henry proudly styled the boy fitz conqueror in token of his illustrious descent from the mightiest monarch in the line of rollo king henry summoned his last parliament in eleven thirty three for the purpose of causing this precious child to be included in the oath of fealty by which the succession to the throne was for the third time secured to his daughter the empress matilda if his queen adelicia had brought him a son after these repeated acts in favor of his daughter by a princess who was regarded by the majority of the people as the heiress of the royal english line in all probability a civil war respecting the succession would have occurred on the death of king henry the barrenness of the beautiful young queen however though so deeply lamented by her royal husband was at that time no doubt a providential dispensation and one of the causes of amity and confidence that subsisted between her and her haughty stepdaughter towards the latter end of that summer king henry embarked on his last voyage for normandy the day was remarkable for a total eclipse of the sun accompanied with storms and violent commotions of the deep it was so dark say the annalists of that era that on board the royal ship no man might see another's face for some hours the eclipse was followed by an earthquake and these two phenomena were according to the spirit of the age regarded as portents of horror and woe and it was predicted that the king would never return from normandy on a former occasion when henry had embarked for england in june eleven thirty one he was so dismayed by the bursting of a waterspout over the vessel and the fury of the wind and waves that believing his last hour was at hand he made a penitent acknowledgment of his sins promising to lead a new life if it should please god to preserve him from the peril of death and above all he vowed to repeal the oppressive impost of denegelt for seven years if he were permitted to reach the english shore in safety from this incident we may infer that henry i was by no means impressed with his brother rufus's bold idea of the security of a king of england from a watery grave but the catastrophe of his children in the fatal white ship had no doubt some effect on his mind during these perils on the deep the summer of eleven thirty three he spent in normandy in feasts and rejoicings for the birth of his infant grandson that event was however only the precursor of fresh dissensions between the ill-assorted pair the empress matilda and her husband geoffrey plantagenet her late visit to england had renewed the scandalous reports respecting her partiality for her cousin stephen of blois and the birth of a son in the sixth year of their marriage to the long childless pair proved anything but a bond of union between them there is no reason to suppose that adelicia was with the king her husband at the time of his death which took place in normandy in the year eleven thirty five at the castle of lyon near rouen a place in which he much delighted it is said that having over fatigued himself in hunting in the forest of lyon he returned much heated and contrary to the advice of his courtiers and physicians made too full a meal on a dish of stewed lampreys his favorite food which brought a violent fit of indigestion called by the chroniclers a surfeit ending in a fever of which he died after an illness of seven days at midnight december first in the sixty-seventh year of his age he appears to have been perfectly conscious of his approaching dissolution for he gave particular directions respecting his obsequies to his natural son robert earl of gloucester whom he charged to take sixty thousand marks out of his treasure chest at Falaise for the expenses of his funeral and the payment of his mercenary troops he solemnly bequeathed his dominions to his daughter the empress not without some indignant mention of her luckless spouse geoffrey of anjou his former elive and bel ami he absolutely excluded him from any share in his bequests and with much earnestness constituted his beloved son earl robert the protector of his daughter's rights 
His nephews, Warren, Earl of Surrey, and Stephen de Blois, Earl of Mortagne, with Robert, Earl of Leicester, were standing round the bed of the expiring monarch, were witnesses of his charge to his son, the Earl of Gloucester. Robert of Gloucester gives the following serio-comic account of the royal willfulness, in partaking of the interdicted food which caused his death. When he came home he willed him a lamprey to eat, though his leeches him forbade, for it was a feeble meat. But he would not them believe, for he loved it well and now, and eat in evil case, for the lamprey it him stew, for right soon after into anguish he drew, and he died for his lamprey unto his own woe. The noble earls who surrounded the deathbed of King Henry, and listened to the last instructions respecting his funeral, attended his remains from the town of St. Denis le Forment, where he breathed his last, to Rowan, and when they entered that city, they reverently bore the bier, on which the royal corpse was laid, on their shoulders by turns. At Rowan, the remains of this mighty sovereign, in preparation for removal to England, underwent the process of embalming, as it was called, according to the barbarous fashion described by the chroniclers. The body was sliced and powdered with much salt, and wrapped in a bull's hide. The remains of King Henry were interred with great pomp, on Christmas Day, at the Abbey of Reading, which he had built and magnificently endowed for that purpose. On the anniversary of the death of her royal lord, Queen Adelicia, to testify her respect for his memory, gave by charter the manor of Eton in Hertfordshire, to the Abbey of Reading, for prayers to be said for his soul, and, by a second charter, she also gave the manor of Stanton Harcourt, in Oxfordshire, and the churches of Chalm, Esslingham, and others, for the expenses of his anniversary, a solemn service for the repose of his soul, which was yearly to be celebrated there. The royal widow also gave one hundred shillings, out of the height or wharf, Queen Hythe, belonging to her in London, to be applied to the expenses of a lamp, to burn perpetually before his tomb. In these charters and deeds, she styles herself Adelid the Queen, wife of the most noble King Henry, and daughter of Godfrey, Duke of Lotharingia. The chroniclers of that reign, several of whom were well acquainted with him, have given the following lively description of the person of Adelicia's royal lord. He was, for personage, of reasonable stature, broad-breasted, well-jointed, and full of flesh, amiable of countenance, with fine penetrating eyes, and black hair, carelessly hanging about his forehead. It is to be remarked, that after he had been induced, by the eloquent preaching of Friar Serlo, to submit his natural ornament to the shears of that priestly reformer, he was very strict in his prohibitions to his subjects against long hair. Two illuminated portraits of Henry I are in existence. Both represent him as advanced in life, and in a melancholy attitude, supposed to be after the loss of his children. His face is handsome, with high and regular features, his hair curling, but not long. His figure is emaciated, he is clad in a very close dress, the shoe and stocking all of one piece, and the toe pointed. He wears a mantle wrapped about him. His crown is ornamented with three trefoils. His scepter is a staff with an ornamented head. He is seated on a stone bench, carved in an architectural design. He is represented in the coronation robes he wore at the crowning of Adelicia. Henry received from his subjects the title of the Lion of Justice. This appellation was drawn from the prophecies of Merlin, then very popular in England. On the ascension of every sovereign to the English throne, all his subjects consult these rigmaroles, as naturally as we consult an almanac, to know when there is a new moon. After two dragons, says Merlin, the lion of justice shall come, at whose roaring the Gaelic towers and island serpents shall tremble. This lion of justice certainly suffered no one to break the laws but himself, if he is accountable for the villainies of his purveyors, his standard of justice was not very high. The king's servants and a multitude following the royal retinue took and spoiled everything the way the king went, there being no discipline or good order taken. When they could not consume what they found in the house they broke into, they made the owners carry it to market and sell it for them. 
they burned the provisions or washed their horses feet with the ale or mead or poured the drink on the ground or otherwise wasted it so that every one hearing of the king's coming would run away from their houses whenever henry the first was under any apprehensions from his brother robert he regulated his household somewhat better and kept the lawlessness of his purveyors within bounds henry carried the art of dissimulation to such a pitch that his grand justiciary started when he heard the king had praised him and exclaimed god defend me the king praises no one but him whom he means to destroy the result proved the deep knowledge which the minister had of his royal master's character as henry of huntington his archdeacon details at length what degree of happiness adelicia the fair enjoyed during the fifteen years of queenly splendor which she passed as the consort of henry beauclerc no surviving records tell but that she was very proud of his achievements and brilliant talents we have the testimony of the poetical chronicler who continued the history of brute from william the conqueror through the reign of william rufus it appears moreover that the royal dowager employed herself during her widowhood in collecting materials for the history of her mighty lord for gamar the author of the history of the angles observes that if he had chosen to have written of king henry he had a thousand things to say which the troubadour called david employed by queen adelicia knew not about neither had he written nor was the louvain queen herself in possession of them if the collection of queen adelicia should ever be brought to light it would no doubt afford a curious specimen of the biographical powers of the illustrious widow and her assistant troubadour david whose name has only been rescued from oblivion by the jealousy of a disappointed rival in the art of historical poetry during the life of the king her husband adelicia had founded and endowed the hospital and conventual establishment of st giles near wilton and according to wiltonshire tradition she resided there during some part of her widowhood in the house which is still called by her name she was likewise dowered by her late husband king henry in the fair domain of arundel castle and its rich dependencies for the forfeit inheritance of the brutal robert earl of bellisme and here no doubt the royal widow held her state at the expiration of the first year of her cloistered seclusion after the death of her illustrious spouse camden thus describes the spot which the magnificent taste of the late duke of norfolk has within the last century rendered one of the most splendid objects of attraction in england beyond selsley the shore breaks and makes way for a river that runs out of st leonard's forest and then by arundel seated on a hill over a vale of the river arun in this saxon castle built and strengthened on the hill above the waters adelicia was residing when she consented to become the wife of william de albini of the strong hand the lord of buckingham in norfolk and one of the most chivalrous peers in europe according to howard's computation adelicia was in her thirty-second year at the time of king henry's death in the very pride of her beauty and she contracted her second marriage in the third year of her widowhood a d eleven thirty eight her second spouse william de albini with the strong arm was the son of william de albini who was called pincerna being the chief butler or cup-bearer of the duchy of normandy william the conqueror appointed him to the same office in england at his coronation in westminster abbey which honor has descended by hereditary custom to the duke of norfolk his rightful representative and heir and when there is a coronation banquet the golden cup out of which the sovereign drinks to the health of his or her loving subjects becomes his perquisite it appears that adelicia and albini were affianced some time previous to their marriage for when he won the prize at the tournament held at burges in eleven thirty seven in honor of the nuptials of louis the seventh of france and eleonora of aquitaine adelaide the gay queen dowager of france fell passionately in love with him and wooed him to become her husband but he replied that his troth was pledged to adelicia the queen of england although it may be considered somewhat remarkable that two queen dowagers of similar names should have fixed their affections on the same gentleman there is every reason to believe that such was the fact but the marvellous legend so gravely related by dugdale 
contains the sequel of the tale, namely, that the unladylike conduct of the rejected dowager of France, in pushing the strong-handed Albini into a cave in her garden, where she had secreted a fierce lion to become the minister of her jealous vengeance, together with the knight's redoubtable exploit in tearing out the lion's heart, which he must have found conveniently situated at the bottom of his throat, a place where no anatomist would have thought of feeling for it, must be regarded as one of the popular romances of the age of chivalry. We have seen another version of the story, in which the hero is said to have deprived the lion, not of his heart, but his tongue. And this is doubtless the tradition relating to William of the Strong Hand, since the Albini lion on the ancient armorial bearings of that house is tongueless, and is, by the by, one of the most good-tempered-looking beasts ever seen. Romance and ideality out of the question, William de Albini was not only a knight sans payer, at sans reproach, stout in combat, and constant in loyalty and love, but history proves him to have been one of the greatest and best men of that age. His virtues and talents sufficiently justified the widow of the mighty sovereign of England and Normandy, in bestowing her hand upon him, nor was Adelicia's second marriage in the slightest degree offensive to the subjects of her late husband, or considered derogatory to the dignity of a queen dowager of England. Adelicia, by her union with Albini, conveyed to him a life interest in her rich dowry of Arundel, and he accordingly assumed the title of Earl of Arundel, in her right, as the possessor of Arundel Castle. It was at this feudal fortress, on the then solitary coast of Sussex, that the royal beauty, who had for fifteen years presided over the splendid court of Henry Beauclerc, voluntarily resided with her second husband, the husband, doubtless, of her heart, in the peaceful obscurity of domestic happiness, far remote from the scenes of her former greatness. Adelicia's wisdom in avoiding all the snares of party, by retiring from public life at a period so full of perilous excitement, as the early part of Stephen's reign, cannot be disputed. Her gentle disposition, her good taste, and feminine feelings, fitted her for the enjoyments of private life, and she made them her choice. There was, however, nothing of a selfish character in the conduct of the royal matron in declining to exert such influence as she possessed in advocating the claims of her stepdaughter Matilda to the throne of England. As Queen Dowager, Adelicia had no voice in the choice of a sovereign. As a female, she would have departed from her province, had she intermingled with intrigues of state, even for the purpose of assisting the lawful heir to the crown. She left the question to be decided by the peers and people of England, and as they did not oppose the coronation of Stephen, she had no pretense for interfering. But she never sanctioned the usurpation of the successful rival of her stepdaughter's right by appearing at his court. And when the Empress Matilda landed in England to dispute the crown with Stephen, the gates of Arundel Castle were thrown open to receive her and her train by the royal Adelicia and her high-minded husband Albini. It was in the year 1139, when this perilous guest claimed the hospitality, and finally the protection of the noble pair, whose wedded happiness had been rendered more perfect by the birth of a son, probably very little before that period, for it was only in the second year of their marriage. And she, over whose barrenness as the consort of the mightiest monarch of the West, both sovereign and people had lamented for nearly fifteen years, became, when the wife of a subject, the mother of a numerous progeny, the ancestress of an illustrious line of English nobles, in whose veins her royal blood has been preserved in uninterrupted course to the present day. According to Malmesbury and many other historians, the Empress Matilda was only attended by her brother, the Earl of Gloucester, and a hundred and forty followers, when she landed at Portsmouth, in the latter end of September. Gervais and Brompton aver that she came with a numerous army, but the general bearings of history prove that this was not a fact, since Matilda was evidently in a state of absolute peril, when her generous stepmother afforded her an asylum within the walls of Arundel Castle, for we find that her devoted friend and brother, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, when he saw that she was honorably received there, considered her in a place of safety, and, attended by only twelve persons, proceeded to Bristol. 
no sooner was stephen informed that the empress matilda was in arundel castle than he raised the siege of marlborough and commenced a rapid march towards arundel in order to attack her in retreat the spirit with which he pushed his operations alarmed the royal ladies adelicia dreaded the destruction of her castle the loss of her beloved husband and the breaking up of all the domestic happiness she had enjoyed since her retirement from public life the empress matilda suffered some apprehension lest her gentle stepmother should be induced to deliver her into the hands of her foe there was however no less firmness than gentleness in the character of adelicia and the moment stephen approached her walls she sent messengers to entreat his forbearance assuring him that she had admitted matilda not as his enemy but as her daughter-in-law and early friend who had claimed her hospitality which respect for the memory of her late royal lord king henry forbade her to refuse the same considerations would compel her to protect her while she remained beneath the shelter of her roof adelicia added that if he came in hostile array against her castle of arundel with intent to make matilda his prisoner she must frankly say that she was resolved to defend her to the last extremity not only because she was the daughter of her late dear lord king henry but as the widow of the emperor henry and her guest and she besought stephen by all the laws of courtesy and the ties of kindred not to place her in such a painful strait as to compel her to do anything against her conscience in conclusion she requested with much earnestness that matilda might be allowed to leave the castle and retire to her brother stephen acceded to the proposal the siege was raised and the empress proceeded to join her adherents at bristol malmesbury assures us that the impolitic conduct of stephen on this occasion was nothing more than what the laws of chivalry demanded from every true knight we are inclined to regard stephen's courteous compliance with the somewhat unreasonable prayer of the queen dowager as a proof of the high respect in which she was held and the great influence over the minds of her royal husband's kindred which her virtues and winning qualities had obtained while she wore the crown matrimonial of england adelicia conducted herself with equal prudence and magnanimity in the defence and deliverance of her stepdaughter exhibiting a very laudable mixture of the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the dove and the courage of the lion the lion was the cognizance of the royal house of louvain and mr howard is of opinion that this proud bearing was assumed by the family of albini in token of descent from the fair maid of brabant rather than with any reference to the fabled exploit of her second husband related in dugdale's baronage in grateful remembrance of the generous conduct of stephen in all probability withheld adelicia and albini from taking part with the empress matilda against him in the long and disastrous civil war which desolated the ravaged plains of england with kindred blood during so many years of that inauspicious reign they appear to have maintained a strict neutrality and to have preserved their vassals and neighbors from the evils attendant upon the contest between the empress and the king adelicia after her happy marriage with the husband of her choice was not forgetful of the respect which she considered due to the memory of her late royal lord king henry for by a third charter she granted to his favorite abbey of reading the church of berkeley harness in gloucestershire with suitable endowments to pray for the soul of king henry and duke godfrey her father and also for the health of her present lord whom she styles william earl of chichester and for her own health and the health of her children thus we observe that this amiable princess unites the departed objects of her veneration in the devotional offices which she fondly caused the monks of reading to offer up for the welfare of her living husband her beloved children and herself to her third son adelicia gave the name of her deceased lord king henry her fourth was named godfrey after her father and elder brother the reigning duke of brabant adelicia chiefly resided at arundel castle after her marriage with william de albini but there is also traditional evidence that she occasionally lived with him in the noble feudal castle which he built after his marriage with her at buckingham in norfolk it is still designated in that county as new buckingham though the mound part of the moat and few mouldering fragments of the wall 
are all that remain of the once stately hall that was at times graced with the dowager court of elix la belle the priory of st bartholomew likewise called the priory of the causeway in the parish of lyminster near arundel was established by queen adelicia after her marriage with william de albini as a convent of augustinian canons it was situated at the foot of the hill which overlooks the town from the south side of the river the number of inmates appears originally to have been limited by the royal foundress to two persons whose principal business was to take charge of the bridge and to preserve the passage of the river all her gifts and charters were solemnly confirmed by her husband william albini who appears to have cherished the deepest respect for his royal spouse always speaking of her as eximia regina that is inestimable or surprisingly excellent queen we find from the monasticon that adelicia gave in trust to the bishop of chichester certain lands in arundel to provide salaries for the payment of the two chaplains to celebrate divine service in that castle the last recorded act of adelicia was the grant of the prebend of west dean to the cathedral of chichester in eleven fifty in the year eleven forty nine a younger brother of adelicia henry of louvain was professed a monk in the monastery of affligum near a lost in flanders which had been founded by her father godfrey and his brother henry of louvain and soon after the royal adelicia herself stimulated no doubt by his example withdrew not only from the pomps and parade of earthly grandeur but from the endearments of her adoring husband and youthful progeny and crossing the sea retired to the nunnery in the same foundation where she ended her days and was likewise buried mr howard in his interesting sketch of the life of his royal ancestress states it to be his opinion that adelicia did not take this important step without the full consent of her husband strange as it appears to us that any one who was at the very summit of earthly felicity should have broken through such fond ties of conjugal and maternal love as those by which adelicia was surrounded to bury herself in cloistered seclusion there is indubitable evidence that such was the fact sanderus in his account of the abbeys and churches of brabant relates that fulgentius the abbot of affingham visited queen adelicia at the court of her royal husband henry i where he was received with especial honors the same author expressly states that adelicia died in the convent of afflingham and was interred there on the ninth of the calends of april he does not give the date of the year from the mortuary of the abbey he quotes the following latin record of the death of this queen aledum genuit cum barbe dux godfridas quae fuit anglorum regina paesimum morum the annals of margan dates this event in the year eleven fifty one there is a charter in afflingham granted by henry of louvain on condition that prayers may be said for the welfare of his brother godfrey the reigning duke and his sister aleda the queen and ida the countess of cleves and their parents adelicia must have been about forty-eight years old at the time of her death she had been married eleven years or thereabouts to william de albini lord of buckingham at his paternal domain of new buckingham in norfolk a foundation was granted by william de albini of the strong arm enjoining that prayers might be said for the departed spirit of his eximia regina he survived her long enough to be the happy means of composing by an amicable treaty the death strife which had convulsed england for fifteen years in consequence of the bloody succession war between stephen and the empress matilda this great and good man is buried in wymondham abbey near the tomb of his father the pincerna of england and normandy by her marriage with albini adelicia became the mother of seven surviving children william earl of arundel who succeeded the estates and honours reiner henry godfried alice married to count de Eu, olivia agatha the two latter were buried at boxgrove near arundel though adelicia had so many children by her second marriage her tender affection for her father's family caused her to send for her younger brother jocelyn of louvain to share in her prosperity and happiness and the munificent earl her husband to enable this landless prince to marry advantageously 
gave him the fair domain of petworth on his wedding agnes the heiress of the percies since which says camden that prosperity of jocelyn who took the name of percy have ever possessed it a family certainly very ancient and noble the male representatives of charlemagne more direct than the dukes of guise who pride themselves on that account jocelyn in a donation of his which i have seen uses the title jocelyn of louvain brother to queen adelicia castellane of arundel two ducal peers of england are now the representatives of the imperial carlovingian line namely the duke of norfolk the heir of queen adelicia and the duke of northumberland the lineal descendant of her brother jocelyn of louvain the two most unfortunate of all the queens of england anne boleyn and catherine howard were the lineal descendants of adelicia by her second marriage with william de albini End of section 12.